Welcome to Radical Feminist Perspectives. Today we are going to consider the book Women's Inhumanity to Women by Phyllis Chesler and it's being discussed by Cindy Aleshkov and Dorothea Anderson. Um, there's a chat and there is also a transcript um, so do get involved and turn on the transcript so you can see subtitles if you want to. So welcome to Cindy and Dorothea and over to you. Dorothea, you're, yeah. uh, sorry, Cindy, you're on mute. Thank you. Okay. So we'll first go into our initial reactions with this book. So I was actually quite attracted to this book first when I saw the, the title to it, Woman's Inhumanity to Woman. And it made me think, well, what does that what does that mean, and what does that look like in our patriarchal system, and how does it affect women from moving forward? And it was also appealing because I had a in my own personal life a difficult relationship with my mother, girlfriends, and um, and sisters, and so I wanted to understand why these female relations were characterized by jealousy, competition, rejection, and to understand the psychological and emotional pain, pain that came out of those relationships. Um, for Chesler, her question is, how do we acknowledge our imperfection, our shadow side, rather than placing all women into binary categories, the main ones being the benevolent um, godmother or the evil stepmother? Chesler notes in her 2009 introduction, and I think it's a good thing to reinforce this point, this isn't about excusing men or reinforcing stereotypes that women are flawed, manipulative, inherently evil, but acknowledging that male-female relations, and on top of that, female-female relations, are about power, but also things are also more. It's some. It's about more than power. The picture is much more complex, and women can play into the victimization of other women. An example she uses is. The brutal and public gang rapes of African girls in Darfur by ethnic Arab Muslims saw female Arabs cheering their men on and hurling racist insults at the, vic at the victims. In this example, Chesla is not saying that these women are entirely innocent or entirely guilty. Clearly, there's a victim and a perpetrator in the crime, but that the women who supported the men in this crime two most likely feared victimization and therefore sought to create space between themselves and the victim. But the question is, well, what does this do to the actual victim who, 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 is, who feels this space um, that, that's created by other women and, and where this kind of indirect aggression is put onto her? Chesler describes this as a kind of soul murder and says that by acknowledging that women are and I quote, as close to the apes as to the angels, we can be more realistic, forgiving and productive, especially when um, we're operating in group structures. Right. Dorothea? Thanks. Yeah, now I hadn't read this book before, and that was because I actually resisted um, the title and the subject matter. I thought there's quite enough bad things to read about in the world without having to, to sort of read something that's actually quite negative about women. I want to hold my positive um, view and it's interesting in the introduction Chesler says that there were similar reactions from feminist colleagues that she she mentioned the book to um, but when Cindy suggested this book I thought right well I shall I shall face it I'll I'll read it and um, engage with the findings however uncomfortable now it is a very long book that's how that's how thick it is it's over 400 pages so it's very very comprehensive in what she covers though she doesn't cover everything but it is quite a bit repetitive at times so but we'll be concentrating on the th key themes and conclusions which keep coming up in in different parts of it so it's based on academic research interviews with women um extracts from literature and, and memoir it's quite descriptive there's less analysis but I do think the insights from this book can help us consider some of the um conflicts and difficulties we, we're having in feminist organizing um, and the you know things like how we organise and the ethics of feminist working that have been discussed at previous um, webinars. I also think it helps illuminate why it is often so often women that are acting on behalf of trans rights activists and bullying those women that stand up for for sex based rights. So if we could have the um, next slide, please, Joe. 
about anyway, this is a, just a summary of the yeah so that's the the introduction then i've got the next slide should be some key points um from from the book um i mean the main ones i wanted to pick out um yeah women women are sexist because we live in a sexist culture and so we internalize misogyny um women are indirectly aggressive and the target is mainly other women and children um women are ambivalent to women leaders especially those who are seen as too male which i think might explain some of the reactions to say hillary clinton um but we do need approval and support from from other women um you know and so we've got this constant desire to um be supported by have an emotional connection to um get approval from women and that doesn't always happen and when it doesn't happen that's when we can get aggression um and feelings of, of pain and betrayal so she's not come claiming that women are as bad as men i mean she acknowledges the far greater impact of of male violence but some women are collaborators with patriarchy and we shouldn't ignore those lesser cruelties and, and betrayals between women her aim is that by acknowledging bad behavior we should be able to improve how we work it work with each other and use our influence to for, for good and there's a, a quote i think it's going to be on the next one but don't don't move it but we have the power to encourage each other to either resist or collaborate with tyranny um so that's a, a challenge to us in our working cindy yeah and when she talks about indirect aggression what she's really talking about is name calling insulting teasing threatening revenge friendships so um using one friend to go against another friend because the other friend may have um, gone against the code of the group or have made herself out to be too different. And so how we actively use friendships to exclude others, um, ignoring, gossiping. And she says all of these things are especially common in female exclusive diets. So Chesler's example of internalized sexism, which you, which you pointed out is one of the key arguments of her book, she says many women that she interviewed believe that wife beating and female genital mutilation is actually justified. In Cambodia, she says jealous wives, wives will throw acid onto their husband's girlfriends, but interestingly enough, not at their philandering husbands. So why does the punishment go to other women rather than onto men? Why is the aggressive, aggression reserved for other women? Another example she uses is when female incest victims um, uh, display more anger at their mothers who fail to protect them than at their fathers who actually raped them. Chessa argues that this is part of the culture of maternal blame, but that it is unfair to place blame on the mother when the father alone has actually raped her. And, and in, in, a few, um, in a few minutes, we'll, we'll, we'll visit this concept of the good enough mother who actively is tolerable, but also act actively harms her daughter. And an interesting point is the bystander effect. In, in the incest case, could the mother have helped the victim or prevented the crime? Was the mother afraid or used to being victimized herself? And for the daughter, is there something more traumatizing when the mother betrays her than when her father betrays her? Um, and it is these questions that Chester seeks to explore in this book. She says internalized sexism is more prevalent and more likely if a woman herself has low self-esteem and little, if any, self-love. Early experiences of betrayal may leave many women seeking out a mother in other women and feeling deeply hurt if a woman does not live up to those expectations, thereby turning other women into, you know, the fairy godmother or the evil stepmother. And again, the use of these archetypes is very um, common throughout Chesler's books. And we, we, we visited some of these archetypes in the previous webinar um, on women and madness. So she talks about the importance of female bonding for our survival, but argues that it's really important when we approach this topic of female on female aggression to leave ideology behind in order to understand this kind of subtle shadow side of women's relationships, um, which is really important because she's saying, um, you know, don't attack me at the beginning, you know, as, as a lot of feminists have done when she even just proposed the title, but 
consider these arguments, consider these case studies, and let's talk about what comes out as a result. So the first chapter, uh, which we'll look at is aggression in primates. Yeah, it's actually, the chapter's actually called The, the Animal Within, which, I, 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 yeah, it kind of sets the tone. I'm not sure if I entirely agree with some of her conclusions in, in this chapter. Um, I mean, she starts by, by pointing out that, yes, male violence is deadly. She's not denying that, but it means it obscures female violence. Um, and she says that women do collaborate in this deadly culture um, by making homes for men and socialising children into this culture. I do think she minimises the effect of compulsory heterosexuality and, and the lack of choice that women have in this. Um, so she sees women as preferring alpha males and competing with other women for them. Um, and women will bully other, you know, other girls and women who don't conform to patriarchy. Um, now, and she sort of quotes uh, examples from anthropological studies of female aggression and, and violence around the world, um, including mothers, mothers-in-law dominating and beating their daughters-in-law, honour killings and dowry murders. But most of the book is actually based on the experiences of middle class and mainly white American women. Um, she, she kind of throws in a bit of um, other cultures, but doesn't really concentrate on them. So. Chesler says that whether female-female cruelty is caused by female opportunism or female captivity, the harm done is real, which is a fair point, but I would say the strategy for change does depend on what the root causes of the problem are. So I think that does need a bit more um, sort of pulling out. So she points out that women are part of conflict in classes, races and religions, which may override sisterly feelings like the incident that Cindy talked about at the start. But cruelty also occurs within within social groups, um, such as ostracizing women for breach of, of sexual um, um, expected behavior. Um, and the internalized self-hatred of some women can be turned on other women, uh, what was identified by writers such as Florence Kennedy and Audre Lorde as horizontal hostility. But women deny having these feelings of hostility and envy because they are not considered nice or ladylike. So they get buried and submerged, but they don't go away. She then turns to looking at research on, on primates um, and gives examples of um, violent behavior, um, chimps, um, you know, female chimps killing each other's infants, um, lemurs as well having violent behaviour. And she says this is a result of sexual competition and the desire to stop rivals uh, reproducing. But I'm really not sure how much these examples shed light on human behaviour, because actually behaviour amongst primates is very, very varied. And yes, there is, you can point to those examples of violence, but bonobos, which are genetically very close to both humans and chimps, have very different behaviours. And females in bonobo um, bands often um, sort of cooperate in and share food, and they use sex to um, diffuse um, tension and rivalries between them. So I think it, that's a, I do think that's a flawed approach. Um, it doesn't really help feminism um, because when you start talking, as she does occasionally, about things being um, you know hardwired. Does that limit the actual potential for, for political change? Is, is it actually helpful to feminists that want to, to challenge? Or does it actually end up with people sort of shouting about clownfishes changing sex to try and justify, um, you know, gender identity ideology? So anyway, that's that's what I will say about that chapter. <laughs> yeah, and I can see where some of those criticisms come from in terms of that whole nature versus nurture debate. Um, I, I felt like I was a bit more sympathetic to this chapter because I've, I've done some reading on Richard Rangham, which is uh, an anthropologist and primatologist that Chessa actually cites in this chapter, um, where, where they talk about um, human hierarchical relations and how we got to where we are now. And Rangham's theory is actually that the dominant um, alpha male or dictator, uh, which is prevalent in chimpanzee social structures, you know, if that occurred in, in human societies long ago, well, where the, the alpha male would have just, you know, steal other men's resources, raped women, um, how did 
we go from the single alpha dominant male to a kind of coalition of subordinate males. And Rangham says, well, with the aid of language and technology, these subordinate males essentially overthrow the alpha male in order to create a kind of egalitarian hierarchical um, male social structure. And within this, it would have been female mate choice that contributed to the evolution of monogamy. So humans can, are said to be loosely polygamous, but we still are primarily monogamous. And it's like, his question was, well, how did that come to be? And essentially, Chesler says, she, she uses the example of some lemurs, um, it was a particular lemur species that preferred monogamy because those females had a, were afforded greater childcare and protection from infanticide from other males and females. And so it got me wondering whether um, Rangham's theory can come into this in a way um, in that, you know, so rather than risking being raped by a number of different women, uh, different men, fe female humans would have um, played into the kind of to get power within that egalitarian um, social hierarchy between subordinate men, it's to go, you know, pair bond with one single male. And so it created a kind of cooperative breeding structure um, in that for their survival, for their health and uh, prosperity, it would have been at their interest to, to, to play into this um, kind of monogamous social structure. And then reading that, that's what kind of made me wonder whether um, there were some comparisons. And so how do you keep um, female competitors away if power comes through other men and access to resources comes from other men? And so Chester says, well, that a lot of that would have come from the evolution of indirect aggression in our behavior. So I, I can see where you're, what you're saying is that does does the concept that is part of our nature limit um, us to, in order to change? But on the other hand, does it explain a lot of this behavior that maybe we're not um, we're not looking at or giving enough attention to? Um, so, what, what do you think about that? Yeah, I well, I'm I'm still sort of, I, I think just think there's so much variation within primate species to pick out one yeah. or the other, or and and so much behavior. Very cultural variation within humans but anyway we'll, we'll move on from that and go mm -hmm. on to her next um a next chapter which is about in indirect aggression um amongst girls and this one I, I could definitely much more relate to in terms of experiences I had um in school um because it's very much focused on on you know this young girls um how that how they sort of work together or not um and she's got um again a bit of a contradiction here because at one point she says you know she says girls and women may have an evolutionary predisposition towards chronic intragender aggression but then she also says that women and girls are culturally trained to in indirect aggression um to fight without hurting each other so the indirect aggression that she identifies are things like gossip um shunning insults ridicule telling secrets um, she identifies this as being a result of girls need to belong and that they want to have intimate friendships um, and often form cliques. There's a fear of rejection um, and a seeking of, of approval and what she describes of as a, as a tyranny of niceness. And one of the things she suggests, which is a key theme throughout this book, is the importance of early maternal relationships in influencing how women behave in the rest of our, our lives. Um, and so she they, they picked out this quote as it is kind of sums up how she's starting from, from that. And it is an, a nice expression of, um, you know, our relationship with our mothers that we, we experienced our first home on earth in a woman's body. We know the taste and smell of it. We swam in human female salty waters before we were born. So perhaps other women still signify home, family, safety, or life itself. So that's her starting point. She draws on psychological research with young children, showing how um, actually girls move from being as physically aggressive as boys to a more social forms of control and aggression as, as they get older, as they get to sort of five, five six onwards. 
there's a great emphasis on conformity um you know dress the same way have the same interests have the same hobbies and often um bullies will target those children girls who are different um in some way the disagreement isn't allowed and that is a constant theme that we'll be coming back to that women find it girls and women find it hard to manage difference and conflict and so it's suppressed it it, or it, or it comes out in um in you know these indirect ways um but it will always keep surfacing it doesn't it doesn't go away and ultimately we need to be able to deal with conflict and difference in order to make any progress um so and I think some of, you know some of the things around how bonding and um sameness I, I thought it helped understand some of the um social contagion in this but you know when you read things in in schools about how once one girl adopts a, a trans identity lots of her friends also do that which I kind of thought was a bit odd um before then and she points out that the you know this may you can think oh this is just sort of you know girls at school but she points out the that the effects of bullying and victimization may last a lifetime and could cause depression anxiety and low self-esteem even if it doesn't even if it's as bad as that it can affect women's trust of other women and lower our expectations of other women which again will then go and play out in other situations where we we work together um yeah, so it's very much about failure to resolve conflicts, a desire for surface agreement, but underneath continued hostility. And we, girls will then compromise as their need to belong is greater than their need to stick to their principles, the fear of confrontation. And I think, yeah, I've, you know, I've, I've experienced that sort of thing in, in different um, areas. So I'll hand over to Cindy for the next section. Yeah, so the next section looked at, um, it was a chapter on how this aggression continued in adult uh, women's relationships. Uh, but then I thought there's a later chapter on um, aggression between sisters and best friends, and a lot of that overlaps, so I thought I'll combine the two together. So interpersonal closeness is a key feature of female, is of the female communication style. Uh, where verbal affection is really important for inspiring trust. However, the same skills can be used to put down other women. It's psychologically difficult to come to terms with, but it results in splitting, the good versus the bad woman. It comes down to competition against other women sexually, for men and for the resources men have, which is why I thought the first chapter, while I guess debatable, still was an important chapter at the beginning because it sets the scene for what she talks about in, in the later chapters. Um, she says that um, indirect aggression occurs by, for example, making oneself attractive or making the competition less attractive. So calling into question whether men can, um, can trust a particular woman's capacity to be sexually monogamous. Um, in other words, growing up, a lot of us would have heard the, the term slut shaming as an, as an example. Um, where this comes out and I, and I thought maybe to to put this forward um Dofia what did you think when uh Chesler quoted Townsend's idea that sexual har harassment regulations may be des designed for benefit of high um maybe designed for the benefit of higher status women against lower status women because I wasn't uh, particularly convinced with, by that I no, I, I, I wasn't. I wasn't either. It was, <laughs> yeah, very, very strange because all women um, are sort of impacted by sexual harassment. And it's the women that are okay. the least power that are, that are impacted the, the most. But I think there is the interesting thing about how women don't always support other women when they make yeah. claims of sexual harassment, yeah. um, mm. you know, or, or the research that's shown that um, women don't always believe other women when they have been you know when they have been raped and you know that sort of thing you know I mean the sort of thing um in the recent um Amber Heard accusing Johnny Depp um of, of violence and the number of women that were hostile and condemning of her and actually defending a male you know a male perpetrator which is very strange yeah, yeah because even if um for example as the common phrase is, you know, sleeping with the boss to get ahead. But mm -hmm. I, I doubt 
how, how much ahead can you really get within any organization mm. by by doing so so i'm not really sure how that would benefit even lower status no. who may get that job promotion you know it doesn't it doesn't, and it doesn't it doesn't yeah. benefit the higher status women because I mean the Me yeah. Too movement was all you know very much about you know celebrities and professional women calling yeah. out you know what what they'd had to put up with you know to to get those roles uh, anyway <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah that was a that was an interesting point that kind of stood out when she said when she mm. made made that um chose to quote Townsend on that um she said direct yet indirect aggression is a means of disavowing um, aggression if confronted so a lot of the times if women are directly aggressive you know the common tactic is not to respond or to kind of wait till that um, episode goes away and then gossip about it later on and that's a means of tainting your opponent's name without having to directly confront her um, so she says staring is another form um, the silent state she says you know when you um, um, just decide not to uh, talk to uh, a woman who you don't like or who may um, have offended you an example another example is really pretending that person doesn't exist not looking at them not engaging with them you know pretending they're not in the room is a common tactic um, and how gossip is also used to damage subjects and it, how it can have really uh, serious consequences so she looks at she uses the honor killing case where she looks at an anthropological report that cited um, an honor killing and it started with a girl named Jamila and we're not giving given the real context of what town this takes place in or how this occurred but basically I'll sum it up Jamila is illiterate and she asks her literate female neighbor to read her a letter she received from a boy named Saeed and it turned out to be a love letter Aisha the little literate um, neighbor and her friend Ka Kaula scolded Jamila and told her to return Saeed's trinkets and then, quote, talk to others. Later on, it was observed that Jamila was holding hands with a boy named Eunice by the female village herbalist who talked. And then uh, Jamila's younger sister, Lila, told Jamila's mother that Jamila was having sex and also she talked to others. Later, by when, her, when Jamila's brothers confronted her, Jamila revealed that she was actually raped by Eunice. And I just, um, I will quickly read out um, a little bit of the quote here because, uh, so she said, when confronted by her brothers privately, Jamila told them that Eunice gave her sleeping pills and took her virginity. Eunice ran away. The village elders got involved, which made the family's, um, which made the family's shame public. The shame was further heightened by a forced and disrespectful marriage ceremony between Jamila and Eunice in which no gifts were exchanged and no marriage certificate certificate was issued and so gossip particularly between women in the village functioned to uphold the patriarchal mores that subordinate them um, and according to the anthropological post-mortem Eunice kept Jamila locked up for 15 days of their marriage he allowed no one to see her he beat her he raped her um, and when Jamila's brothers finally inquired about their sister who no one had seen Eunice, for the first time, complained that he had not married a virgin because, of course, he raped Jamila before they were married. And within hours of the accusation, one of Jamila's brothers had knifed her to death. So in, in the report, Jamila's mother even stated that she didn't mourn her, her daughter. And when she wept, um, she said, why did my daughter behave in a manner which made her death necessary? So it was just an interesting way to point out how internalized sexism has these life affecting uh, these uh, serious consequences on on daughters and on women in, in a society or a community so the tendency to prefer women who know their place and um and uh, is referred to by chesler as ambivalent sexism it results in another split another uh, love admiration and idealization of certain women for example homemakers um, sexually available women and the fear of others, career women, feminists, unattractive women, and the demonization of those who um, who defy or recreate in themselves male power or authority, which is in a way the ultimate taboo to, to act and be like a man. It may come down to the egalitarian intimate diet preference, 
that you talked about earlier and the larger consequences to difference. Um, so the implications, if we uh, pull up the PowerPoint, um, there's a uh, just a quote that I um, picked out on the implications of sexism and how it harms women. Um, so I think it's in the next slide. Uh, slide after that. Oh yes, the sexist myth. So only bad the belief and the internalization of the of this belief that only bad girls are raped, that women provoke rape by their appearance and behavior, that women enjoy rape, that women charge rape out of vindictiveness, that black women are more sexually experienced than white women and plus thus less harmed by an assault, and that rapists are abnormal men without access to consensual sex. So I thought this was um it, you know it's it's a how this has real life consequences is well we can think about how um, the larger conversation of why pornography is tolerated and accepted by many women or why many girlfriends will attend strip clubs with their uh, male partners. Um, so that in a way that's also an, an effect and a result of this internalized sexist myth. So this plays out in the workplace, in groups, in mother-daughter relations, but also between sisters and friends. Um, and, um, and in a way, it really comes down to longing for intimacy, but fearing that the female intimate is, intimate is also potentially a betrayer. Um, so the value of connection, um, oh, sorry, my, my notes are a bit all over the place, but what I'm trying to say here is that um, we, we almost sacrifice honest communication with other women in case of an offense, feeling offended, um, where if a, another woman turns against, against you as a woman, that can result in serious consequences, but also social death, maybe gossiping, maybe what are the implications of, those gossip, of, of that gossiping? And so while we wanna recreate this shadow mother and shadow sisters, we long for other women to be intimate with us. We're also limited by the system that we operate in, which results in competition and results in, um, in betrayal. Um, Chester says the hurt from another woman cuts deeper because it has deeper impacts on her social stand, standing. standing. So she, she takes the case of um, a best friend betrayal where um, a woman called Charlotte invited a woman 10 years older into her home and it turned out that this woman while interjecting herself into Charlotte's life eventually stole her husband and um, Charlotte who felt so betrayed and all of her blame in this interview with Chesla came onto this best friend who came into her life rather than blaming her husband who also was a participant in the affair. So th therefore it's this difficulty to deal with differences between women, uh, differences in resources, differences in luck and circumstances hurt women because we're made to feel that only one woman can, can win, only one woman can be the Miss America, only one woman can be the wife. Um, and Dorothea, did you have any other points on this chapter? Yeah, I mean, I suppose my, my reservation about some of the aspects of all, all the book, and we can come on to this a bit more when we move on to the next section where she's looking at some of the family dynamics uh, in more detail, is that she seems to put everything down to some of this um, childhood and, and maternal things. And as though that everybody has this kind of problematic relationship with, and, and I didn't have a problematic relationship with my mother or with my sister. Um, doesn't make me a perfect person, but I wonder if my bad behaviour, and I have I have had bad behaviour in, in my time, I can relate to some of the bad examples as well, and, and other people's bad behaviour is just sometimes down to personality, to circumstance, to, you know, it, it may, I, I think she focuses very much on, on one cause rather than maybe looking at, you know, women are individuals, we, we have good and bad characteristics, um, which may or may not be related to, to family dynamics. But anyway, that's a <laughs> that's just my my re my reservation about about some of this. Um, and as say, you move on to the the next bit, and there's, there's yeah, a slide to go with the next bit as well, isn't there? So. Yeah, 
then you're definitely not going to like the um the mother daughter <laughs> psychoanalytic yeah. explanation <laughs> yeah so if we can pull up the slide um just to give it really helps because this was for the you know i'm a lay lay reader i don't have any training in um psychoanalysis or anything so this was really difficult to wrap my head around but at the same time and there's a lot here um and it was yeah i had to read it multiple times to to realize what she was actually trying to say so she starts off this chapter from a freudian perspective she says both boys and girls become matrophobic that is despising and hating their mothers but psychologically there's a big difference that plays out boys do not kill them um their their mothers or the, um, or their fathers because boys because of the fear of castration and the loss of social power and instead boys give up their mothers to become like their fathers so note here that um that they do not want to identify boys do not want to identify with their mothers and chesler says that's the basis of heterosexual male identity where the young man hopes to also have a mother wife of his own one day he does not have to compete with her in order to become her. So he doesn't have to reject her within himself in the same way that a lot of girls do. So a girl wants her mother, mother's love all to herself. So in a way, she's retaliating for her mother, choosing her brothers slash the, the father over the daughter. And the theory is the wanting of a union with the feminine eternal. In other words, the mother figure. So it's not necessarily the actual mother but it's this mother figure relation to contemplate losing the feminine eternal is to comp contemplate death so there are again um even though in real life indirect aggression of sometimes does have life and death consequences for women it, at the at the foundation of this to even think about losing the intimacy with with that feminine eternal is to contemplate death so a daughter's overt dependence, insatiability leads her to feelings to feeling guilty. She is actively devouring the feminine eternal, and so she fears retaliation. She's also resentful and envious of the maternal resource. She's jealous. I think um, uh, I have it in my notes here. I was reading from the slide. Um, she's uh, yes, she's jealous of the mother sharing her resources and also terrified of this enormous desire. So that's really a lot. In other words, in the subconscious, a lot of emotions are playing out in to form women's uh, shadow self in a way, including jealousy, resentment, um, envy, terror, uh, and also guilt. Um, hence, there's this fear slash ret retaliation that arises when one woman is dependent upon another for love and sustenance in any sense. Subconsciously, Chesler argues it may remind her of this initial uh, feminine eternal relationships. Little girls realize this quite early that the mother is not an unending resource and that she may even prefer men to her own daughter in ways that she interacts with uh, the father. So the little girl may also start to prefer men or refuse to do so, but all she really wants to do is to have union with her mother. And the little girl, uh, in, in her early years experiences um, her pride being deeply wounded by discovering about this male preference. This is an early form of rejection and betrayal. So Chesler says psychologically, most women continue to unconsciously experience themselves as daughters and all other women as potentially benevolent, but also potentially withholding and threatening mothers. And this is really important because this is fundamentally what plays out in adulthood, in girlhood, in groups, in workplaces. It's this desire and fear that are at almost like a tug of war with each other. So she says, um, in the best friend intimate diets that are established at a young age, that are often established, it's where girls can act out being independent from their mothers, but then they realize that nothing really works. They cannot ever get over the need for the perfect mother or the loving God. And this is an interesting point that she only elaborates in one sentence further. So Chester says, the perfect mother is also the point of origin, a passage from non-being to being. It is access to pure power. But she never goes further than that. So it's like, it's, um, it would have been good if, I guess, a, a, a greater section was devoted to explaining this 
kind of form or perspective of power within women and how how that male preference does then cut deep um, when it, it is discovered that the mother actually prefers the father to, to her own daughter or, or has that son preference. Um, and it plays out again and again in different relationships, even with, as I, as I noted, even relationships with one's own daughters. So um, she, there's an, um, I might read it out because it is a good, it is a good quote and I'll be quick <laughs> about it because I know time. Um, she says, you know, Sybil has three teenage daughters and in her interview, when they fight with me or contradict me, I feel like they're betraying me. I need them to side with me, to support me emotionally. When they beat up on me, that's what it feels like. I forget all about why it's important for daughters to rebel. I only feel they're about to destroy me, just like my mother tried to do. So it's interesting in that, in Sybil's case, that that mother-daughter relationship came out even with her relationship with her daughters. And Chesla then goes on to her own personal betrayals by her intellectual daughters. Um, she, she talks about a situation with an incompetent research assistant, um, plagiarism by her colleagues, uh, not being cited by a female student, and even demands by, uh, by her female student to publish her work anonymously because, quote, all women are equal, aren't they? So it's applicable to feminists maybe who feel unappreciated and not fully credited by each other. Um, when women are recognized selectively um, in the feminist canon, um, it might be uh, maybe even experience, it might be a form, Chesla says, of psychological matricide. We're cutting out certain women who we may not agree with or who we may, for some reason or other, um, choose not to include or, um, or to, to talk to in terms of their theories. So the hunger for an omnipotent mother and a dutiful daughter is playing out here. Um, did you want to say something yeah, about that? Yeah, I mean, I, I do think that's interesting because I think one of the things I've always sort of uh, wondered about in terms of feminism as a sort of political and theoretical um, tradition is why so often one generation of women seem to want to reject the work of the one before um you know rather than trying to build on it find critique it where need need be but build on it so we've got a developing feminist um analysis and, and body of theoretical work but i suppose if there is this matricide going on that might explain why some women feel that they can't acknowledge and celebrate the work of their you know intellectual mothers and have to kind of try and mm -hmm strike out on their own and 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 reject it so you, you know um I don't know it just it's, it's interesting um yeah. I think that's and one of the really things we the... need to stop doing if feminism is going to progress is stop this stop start waves um idea yeah and in particular actually this actually occurs a lot of the times in liberal in the liberal feminist um group I guess mm. just because uh, I've noticed so many times I pick up a book that talks about the origins of feminism and evolution of feminism, as, as they call it. And when it comes to the second wave, there's a huge gap missing. And it's almost like, oh, a few selective voices. And then now we're on the third wave where it's all about choice. It's all about, mm. um, it's all about, I guess, what individual women want, the individualization of, of the movement. So it definitely plays out, but yeah, even within the radical feminist movement, are there certain voices that are being silenced because they don't um, necessarily, we don't agree with all their points of analysis, you know, is that is that a kind of a problem or maybe that's mm. a point of conversation that comes out of Chesler's yeah. analysis, maybe mm. useful. Yeah, it's certainly um, something to think about. So anyway. <laughs> yeah. And then um, last point I'll make in, in this section in terms of the psychoanalytic tradition is the good enough mother. And I, I, I was, it was a bit of a laugh, wasn't it, in our mm. meetings because how she defined the good enough mother was quite um, unexpected. <laughs> yeah. And again, there's so a slide if, for that, isn't there? The good enough mother. Yeah. yeah. If we can pull up that slide, yeah. um, that would be good. Yeah, no, isn't it? Yes, no. <laughs> oh, well, could carry, carry on, Cindy, because we're, we're running right. out um, of time. Yeah, that's okay. So um, I, I do have the quote here, though, so mm -hmm. um, bear with me. 
So she says, and it's really interesting because um, reading literature about child development, the good enough parents were always defined as um, not perfect parents, you know, parents who make mistakes, but who overall have good intentions. But the way that Chesler defines the good enough mother is that the mother may routinely treat her daughter in ways that are acceptable, yet horrendous. So examples of this include constant generalized criticism, criticism of her daughter's appearance, coldness and silence. So uh, Chesler had her own um, ex um, experience with her mother that she elaborates in this section, on especially on coldness and si silence. The preference for a sick child, the good enough mother also pathologizes her healthy daughter. And in our earlier meetings, um, you pointed out that this may, you know, she may be onto something there because in a lot of cases, when we're looking at kids um, being affected by transgender ideology, it's the mothers who encourage them to um, encourage the kids to trans and who support trans ideology. So um, then she talks about beating and whipping, uh, preference for sons. Um, and there's a really interesting quote on uh, where she talks about her own, Chesler's own experience. Um, she says, <clears throat> my mother was a hero. She was determined to be a modern woman. In 1940, this meant listening to what the male medical experts told you to do. Thus, in order to minimize the risks of germs, she wore a surgical mask whenever she came near me when I was a baby. I have photos of my mother, the masked stranger, holding me in my bedroom. My mother did not breastfeed me. She did as her American generation was ordered to do, bottle feed at rigid intervals. Otherwise, let the infant cry. Do not pick her up or feed her. Truly, I am the daughter of male experts. I am not my mother's daughter. I thought that was a really um, interesting quote <clears throat> in, ter <clears throat> in terms of um, preferring and believing the male systems and promises. Um, and it occurs even today where many women are abused and raped by medical professionals before, during or after birth because they're told to distrust their bodies, they're told to distrust their babies. Um, uh, preference for a sick child, I saw in the comments. So um, she said, uh, you know, how much certain mothers felt needed and therefore powerful when they have a sick child around. So they always preferred that sick child um, to their daughters or in other words uh, an, an, another case would be to make their child sick so where I think it's Man Manchhausen by proxy syndrome um, and that that's what she she kind of talks about with the pathologization of healthy daughters she also talks about um, sexual surveillance so um, participating in male sexual surveillance where the fathers would um, would uh, uh, ask their daughters about, you know, their sexual experience and demand to know about um, their sexual relationships, but mothers themselves surveilling um, what their daughters were wearing, checking if they were wearing bras, checking if they had makeup on, and, um, and, and, and that. Uh, in addition, collaboration with incest and maternal envy, so um, especially of accomplished daughters and Phyllis Chesler experienced this herself. So it's a pretty large section about her own personal experiences with her mother. And we were saying that um, in our earlier meetings that uh, it felt very, very personalized. And sometimes to the point of, I was in a way uncomfortable reading it because it was like a diary entry. You know, it was her, um, her, her trying to work things out with her mother who, who passed away. And so, but there's, there's value in that as well. So it's, you know, you might really like the section or you might really feel uncomfortable reading it. Um, and now we'll look at women in the workplace, so how this plays out in the workplace and in groups. Yeah. Um, so she talks about women in the workplace as one of the things being, again, that women are competitive but aren't supposed to show it. So they deny it and conceal it. Competition is seen as dangerous, so it surfaces in different ways and can be destructive. Um, and so women aren't able to deal constructively with criticism. It's either suppressed or punished and or met with anger. And I have definitely uh, experienced this when both giving and receiving criticism in the workplace, although I was annoyed when uh, colleagues reacted badly to me criticising um, their maybe plans for a project we were working on. I also 
would a kind of be very, very upset and rejecting when anybody did the same back to me. Um, and possibly more so when it was from a, a female manager than, than a male. But um, yeah. I mean, she does acknowledge that women's difficulties with each other at work are caused by male domination and the consequent tokenism um, for women, and that women are often competing for a limited number of places, especially if they're trying to advance in the hierarchy. And she does um, have some findings based on interviews that um, we, um, workplaces that are more integrated and allow more women opportunities may be less destructive and competitive between women than, than ones where it's very uh, traditional. But she also looks at a case study of a female owned firm with predominantly female staff, and that had its own tensions and, and difficulties. There was a sort of um, surfaced um, ideology of a happy family atmosphere, but that actually again submerged the tension um, didn't allow for individual, um, you know, sort of differences, freedom in, in how women approach their work um, and, and just created its own very stultifying um, atmosphere. She sees it as a desire for women to recreate the family in the workplace, which leads to unrealistic expectations that other women should be a friend or a mother rather than a, a boss or a subordinate. And that, again, the resolved, unresolved issues um, play out. And treating female colleagues as if they were family can lead to misplaced trust. And though great um, shock and, and you know, distress, if then there is unethical behaviour. Um, you know, that women have unrealistic expectations and that's as a result of sexism, um, their own internalised sexism. Now, one thing I do, uh, she says, bad experiences may lead women to prefer to work with men as they are more straightforward and predictable. Not in my experience. <laughs> I've worked with bullying, manipulative men, and they can gossip and backstab as much as, uh, you know, any of the women that I've worked with. So I do think she's slightly blinkered sometimes about, about men's role in all this. Um, you know, women in workplaces, schools, families, you know, often do have to deal with men and, and the dynamics that men introduce um, are, are as important as the, the intra-female um, um, dynamics. Um, she then moves on to sort of women working in groups, and this is where it potentially gets interesting for feminism. Um, I mean, and she, she starts just with sort of general groups um you know ones that are set up maybe for um you know charitable volunteer uh, purposes religious groups um how women came together in convents to find community or the chinese marriage resistors that enabled some some independence she includes then a lot of case studies based on interviews of women in different groups and the difficulties they've faced but that shows a great variation in it in experience and she actually identifies both positive and negative behaviors um, that women may use the power of a group to control humiliate or reject members but also that many women respect and depend upon their all female groups and try to act in kind and responsible ways and she doesn't do the analysis that would allow us to understand what factors within a group promote good behavior or enable bad behavior? Is it to do with the purpose of the group, the way it's set up, um, you know, what structures is it? There's nothing of that. So that it, that doesn't actually help us know how to, how to progress. Um, one of the issues in groups is that the, um, there's a tendency of women to form cliques and small groups, which again, I think she sees as recreating the, the family um, dynamic and the, the difficulties again in dealing with anger and conflict will surface. So the repeated themes throughout um, the book um, are sort of coming together here. The projection of maternal longing onto female leaders, fear of competition and ability to manage conflict and manipulation. And the key problem, she says, is failing to face up to our own or others' bad behaviour. Um, you know, most women will look the other way when somebody engages in unethical behaviour. Um, they don't challenge gossip. They may be afraid that they're the next target, which I think is does is something that's very real. Um, you know, you might, you know, join in with the bullies for fear of becoming your target themselves. There, there is there is always that element. Um, but then she also suggests that 
uh, women may appease bullies or exploitative women rather than challenging them using the techniques they've had to develop to appease males. Um, there's a there's a slide. I'm not sure which, which one, but I think we've got some quotes again on that. I thought I had the slide number written down, but uh, uh, but about women being too sensitive, too demanding. Um, and she, but I think because Chesler's background is um, psychoanalysis and psychology, she actually seems to suggest that the only way out of this is for women to sort of form female therapy groups um, and points out that otherwise uh, we're, some women will try to turn feminist groups into group therapy, which, which is true, but, um, you know, women haven't necessarily got the time, the money or the inclination to spend a lot of time in feminism. They want to get on, say, with their with their political struggle. Um, but, you know, she says women's liberation groups weren't any different from, from other groups. They've achieved positive, you know, they, she's not denying that they've achieved many positive social and legal changes, but things, you know, problems like trashing um, were identified early on. But she actually says it was the ideas of sisterhood that made this hard to resolve. If we're all sisters together, then how do we deal with difference? Um, you know, there were, so there were attempts to deny social and political differences, but they would come up so you know black women for instance would feel that white women were being racist towards them but didn't have a positive way to resolve um those things she says psychologically we behave like women not revolutionaries um which is kind of suggesting that a male model of revolutionaries i'm not i'm not sure about that i'm not sure what it's not clear what she thinks we should have done differently and again I would the, we all know that male um political groups especially on the left have got a long history of infighting and splitting um you know so so it's even in in comedy sketches isn't it um but it I think the, the key points here that she's coming to are these ones at the end that feminists did not accuse each other of having internalized sexist attitudes it was fine to complain about racism or classism anti-semitism but not to tackle the internalized sexism and misogyny and so it wasn't worked on as a problem to be overcome in the same way that some of those other things um were so I think in a way, I mean, oh, oh, we're running out of, of time, but I would say her ba her, basically her recommendations are very much, they almost read like self-help. You know, we've got to learn to love each other, love each other, other women, acknowledge our bad behaviour. And, and yes, but surely to achieve feminism as a political project, we need to do a lot, a lot more than that. Um, yeah. Some of it did feel like mother blaming because so much of it was put down onto to family dynamics um, and there wasn't enough then political analysis. Um, and so much of it, as, as Cindy said, about her trying to understand and come to terms with incidents in her own life, especially a mother, but also what she's experienced as betrayals by other feminists. Um, and she... Yeah, she's, I think there's other femi feminists who have written about women's role in upholding patriarchy that do have uh, better political analysis. I mean, certainly, you know, Dworkin uh, in, in Right Wing Women and, of course, Mary Daly in, in Gynecology and the Crusader Ritual Syndrome. So, Cindy, so right, we've got <laughs> over to you for your yeah. final. <laughs> yeah, I, look, I agree. Um, there was a lot of gaps in the analysis and she went for breadth rather than depth. Um, the, the way that the book was structured was, um, I guess, it could have used more structure. There was a lot of jumping around to all the different examples and pulling out, you know, the psychoanalytic tradition and then her own clinical studies and then her, her various literature reviews. But at the same time, um, what she comes down to is, well, difference does not have to mean disconnection. So maybe that's a talking point that could be useful within the radical feminist movement. But also, how, how do we... Uh, how to tr how can we train to choose justice and how can we be more openly democratic i think these are all i think good and uh, productive points uh, to improve communication with with each other mm. so yeah so yeah a flawed book but uh, interesting to read and uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> anyway thank thank you cd thanks for everybody for um being here and listening to us and making some interesting comments in the chat that i wasn't really able to to look at but i think we'll we'll get it uh, later so thank you everybody and i'll see some of you in the breakout room hopefully <laughs> goodbye <laughs>